All right, welcome everybody tonight. Uh, last time we finished up uh, the verses across the bottom to talk about the heart. It's very important for us to remember that behavior always flows from the heart. And the Bible is very clear about that. Our behavior always flows from the heart and from the desires of our hearts. All right, so we've uh, finished all these verses on the heart at the bottom. I just want to say for anybody who's watching this uh, by way of video, if you want to get a copy of this particular chart, um, I'll be happy to mail that uh, out to you uh, or email that out to you. And you can uh, just send me an email at dbender at baycitybaptist.org and I'll get that out to you. Okay, so we're picking up on the chart right here where it talks about heart corruption. All right, now this is a, I've drawn this on the board for you several times, but this is really, this, is, this is, might be kind of one of the most important things that you ever draw when you're counseling with somebody, okay? So here's Adam and Eve. I know you've seen this a hundred times already, okay? This fall right here is what affected the human race and our uh, planet more than anything else. So you have to be able to describe this. And we're about to read about the fall in Genesis chapter 3. Okay, so this is a, this is a place where this becomes very important. And, and so as I've been saying, everybody now is born in this, this fallen state, locked in this fallen state. It would be easy to think that every person that's born is born up here, and then each person you know, takes their own fall. But that's not how it works. We are born fallen. We're born with a sinful nature. We have that the moment that we're born. It's very important for people to understand that. Because when they do, then, then we can help them. Uh, we can help them, in a sense, to be raised back up you know, you know, with Christ. Okay? All right. So we're, we are in Genesis chapter 3, verses 1 through 7. And this is the account, then, of the fall. We've looked at verse 6 already, so we won't take a lot of time here. But Genesis 3, starting at verse 1, it says, Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Has God indeed said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden? Questioning God's goodness. That's what's happening right there. And don't we do that in our fallen nature right now? We, we question God's goodness. It's one of the first things we do whenever something doesn't go our way. Verse 2, And the woman said to the serpent, of course being Satan, We may eat the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. Then the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die. Of course, that is an outright lie. Verse 5, For God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Those five words right there, you will be like God, to me, that seems, that seems like the core words that Satan uttered to Eve. And the, the, reason why, the reason why those words seem so important to me, because that is so important to Satan. He wanted to be like the Most High. I will be like the Most High. All of the I wills that you find in, uh, in, in the book of Isaiah. Uh, so those words, I think, are, are just really key words. Then verse 6. This has to be the darkest verse in the darkest chapter of the whole Bible. And so it says, Then, or so when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree desirable to make one wise, she took of its food and ate. She also gave to her husband with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of them both were opened, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves coverings. Of course, the story goes on right there. And uh, God comes looking for them. Uh, you know, an interesting question there. Verse 9. Then the Lord God called to Adam and said to him, Where are you? It's an interesting way to approach Adam, isn't it? Do you think that uh, God knew where Adam was? 
of course, he knew where he was. All right. And then, of course, it goes on. The, the conversation uh, takes place. And then God pronounces the curse on, on Satan uh, down in verse 14, starting in verse 14. Then he pronounces the curse on the woman in verse 16. And then he pronounces the curse on, the, uh, on Adam, uh, verse, starting in verse 17 right there. It's interesting, the curse on the serpent. Uh, the serpent goes, uh, when, when you think about snakes, there just isn't a lower being than the snakes. Snakes don't even have any legs. So you, you think about uh, you know, how Satan wanted to go high, and remember what God does with people who want to go high? He brings them low. So Satan then is symbolized as a snake, flat on, on his belly, on the ground, you know, through the grass, down into the holes, just, just as low as you can possibly get. I think the symbolism there is just really clear. And the, the, uh, the feeling that, we, that most people have about snakes, just that, oh, there's something about snakes, isn't there? There are other creatures, of course, in the world that have kind of, they make us feel a little bit strange, and, but, but the snake, it, it feels a little bit unique, doesn't it, from all other uh, uh, creations or beings? Of course, uh, the woman's curse there again, and then the man's curse. We won't, we won't take time to go through those, but uh, so the fall of man is extremely important, and it's very important for us to make sure that we cover that. Okay, so this is really important now. These verses across the bottom, if, if you're working through this chart with somebody and you don't go through these verses, the rest of this chart is absolutely meaningless and hollow. Okay, so if you uh, minister to somebody using this, these verses are the most important thing. The rest of it's just all. So you have to be careful not to race through these. Um, if you race through these, the rest of this won't make sense. But if you explain all of this to people, then the rest of this all just kind of, it falls into place and it makes just total sense to people. Now, of all those verses then across the bottom, the one that may need the best explanation is the verses on the fall, which we just did. Genesis 3, 1 to 7. Now you might find that as you work through different verses across the bottom, you might highlight the importance of some of these verses more with one person than you do with somebody else. And you kind of have to know that. Uh, when I am ministering to somebody who doesn't know Christ, uh, maybe it's somebody who's, who has come from a Catholic background and they do not understand the gospel, I make sure that I get this across. I get the fall across. Because then later what we're going to talk about is, we're going to talk about how through Christ then we can be raised up again. And it's not through our own works. Okay? Alright, so, uh, so the fall then is extremely, extremely important. Let's go then next to Romans 1.25. Romans 1.25. Romans 1 is one of those passages of scripture that when you read it, oh man, you get, you get to that middle part and then you start to see some of these things that people started to do. It's dark, isn't it? You, parts of it you don't even want to read, you just kind of want to skim, skim past it. Notice there, uh, let's go ahead and start with uh, verse 18, Romans 1.18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. There is a truth suppression that takes place in the hearts of people. Let's go ahead and go down then. Uh, let's go down to verse 20. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and God, and so that they are without excuse. Verse 21, because although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were thankful. I think we talked about this, this um, word earlier in another lesson, but that just seems so innocuous, doesn't it? It just says, they did not glorify God, 
they did not glorify him as God, nor were thankful. Well, oh, come on. That's just not that big of a deal, is it? Well, if you remember, you know, when, we, when we, we've drawn our loop up here um, so many times, you know, here's God and here's man. When God gives something to man, there's supposed to be a loop back that takes place from man to God. And if this doesn't take place, so if we, if we get rid of this right here, all right, this is all wrong. And so when we're not thankful, that's, I think, I think that's huge. I think it's bigger than we, than we tend to think of it, all right? Okay, and then at the end of that verse, second half of verse 21, it says, but became futile in their thoughts and their foolish hearts were darkened. Then you, you get down to verse 20, or 23, and change the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man and birds and four-footed animals and creeping things. So there's idolatry right there. Therefore, God also gave them up to uncleanness and the lust of their hearts to dishonor their bodies among themselves. And then here's the verse that we're, that is on the actual chart itself. It says, who exchanged the truth of God for the lie and worshiped and served the creature or created things rather than the Creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. And then, from there on out, through the rest of the chapter, 26 through 32, it's just the kind of stuff you don't even want to read. But it's the truth. It happened way back then, and it's all of the same stuff that's still happening today. God gives them up, and when God gives people up, man, things just descend into the, into the deep, dark basement really fast. All right, so verse 25 there then talks about uh, worshiping and serving created things rather than the creator. All right, so so then this is where our our drawing that we've been doing here comes into play. You've got man man left by himself. There's no more God, and then man is looping all of his desires uh, back onto himself like so. Now, if you don't have when you're drawing this little diagram for somebody. And I'll usually draw this on the back of my chart like this. All right, so you don't have an eraser probably, so you can erase this. What I'll usually do is I've got God here like this. What I'll do is I'll, I'll, either, I'll either take my hand and I'll cover it up and I'll say, God is eliminated. Now who's at the top now? Man is at the top. Or I'll just take and I'll put a big X like this through God and say, now man is at the top. So however... You want to handle that when you're ministering to somebody and you're using this chart along with the diagram. All right, so you can see uh, idolatry gets, gets started here. All right, the next uh, verse that we'll go to is 1 John 2.16. These next few verses, we've, we've talked about these already, and we've, we've taught through them, but now we're just taking them and then we're putting them in the context on the on the diagram here. All right, so we won't take time to explain because we did that in an early, earlier lesson. All right, First John chapter two and verse sixteen says, "For all that is in the world, the lust of the eyes, or the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world." Okay, so as you're working through this chart with somebody, I'm I'm going through it pretty quickly right now. Because we've already talked about it. But when you get to this point, you're going to have to take time to talk about 1 John 2.16. And then you're going to link it to the categories of desires across the bottom right here. Okay? All right. Uh, next, uh, Luke chapter 4, verses 1 through 13. No need to turn there. Uh, that, of course, is the temptation of Jesus in the wilderness. After a 40-day fast, Satan comes along, uh, tests him in those, those these same three categories across the bottom. Uh as you work with people, it will be good for you to develop um, kind of uh, your own way to work through the story or the account of the temptation of Jesus. Uh, be careful about being tempted to, to moving through these verses again too fast. It might, it might not seem like you want to take the time to read through the whole temptation of Jesus. And to tell you the truth, I don't always read through the whole story with the temptation of Jesus. I try to, but every situation is just a little bit different. Sometimes you know you've got to move things ahead just a little bit faster uh, than with others. 
Okay, and then the next passage there at the bottom of your chart is James 4, verses 1 through 12. Uh, we've recently went through that in a past lesson as well. Uh, once again, make your way <coughs> reading through the whole passage and explaining, explaining it as, uh, as best you can. All right, so then these last verses here uh, across the bottom, they kind of round out our understanding before we start to, before we start to move into the rest of the chart. And once again, we need to explain the verses clearly because they're, they're the foundation wall that everything else here sits on, okay? All right, now let's continue on the chart here talking about the three categories of desire. So we've got desires of the flesh, desires of the eyes, and desires for glory and superiority. All right, so since we've talked about these before, and you've got the definitions right there at the bottom of your chart, Actually, I'm going to resist the desire to, to go through this too fast. So let's just read each of these together there then. All right, so for desires of the flesh, this is what, the, this is what, your, uh, this is what your mind is telling you when you're facing this. I want what feels good to my body. I want what pleases me. I just want to have fun. So this drive is all about pleasure. Now, think about the five senses. If you're taking notes, this would maybe be a good place to talk about that. Think about the five senses. What if God, you know, didn't, what if God only gave us senses just simply for, for example, uh, what if God only gave us the sense of touch so that if when we touched something, we knew it was hot and we'd have to remove our hand? What if that's all the sense of touch was for? That would mean that back rubs wouldn't mean anything, right? Every, all of the five senses that you have all have the capacity to give you pleasure. Think about that. Think about, uh, think about hearing. And think about beautiful music. Or think about listening to uh, songbirds or nature. Uh, and just the, just the beauty of that. So every sense that you have has the capacity to give you pleasure. Isn't it kind of neat to know that? All right, so desires of the flesh. Here's the second category across the bottom. And again, as you're working with people through this, uh, you're just, you can, you can throw in the five senses and you're defining them for them as you're working through these with them. All right, desires of the eyes is next. I want the beautiful things my eyes see. I want many things. I want what you have. I want to take possession of anything that appeals to me. I want to have it all. This drive is about ownership. Now, illustrations for these are going to come up as we get to the indicators farther up the chart. And then the third category across the bottom there, uh, desires for glory and superiority. And you can see pride of life is in parentheses right there. So the way I've been saying this to you is the flipped over version of desires for, for glory and superiority is what the Bible calls the pride of life. And it says to us, I want glory. I want to be lifted up. I want superiority. I want to be in charge. I want to be first. I am not like others. I will, like Satan in Isaiah 14, uh, those I wills of Satan. Uh, Sometimes I've turned to those with people, and sometimes I don't. All right, but Isaiah chapter 14, the I wills of Satan. All right. Okay, let's see here. Okay, so as, as I mentioned, as we think about these categories of desire, all of these were designed to link us back to God. And ever since the fall... And ever since, ever since Adam and Eve, every human being has perverted these in exactly the same way Adam and Eve did when they reached out their hands for the tree. Of course, Eve was the one that plucked the fruit, so to speak, okay? but she shared it with her husband. And when they, when they touched it and ate it, they both wanted it. And now we do exactly the same thing. So there's almost like a, I don't know, that it's not really necessarily a really great way to think of this, but maybe here's one way to do it. Okay, so here's, let's just say here's Adam and Eve right here, 
and then descendants, 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 descendants. It's almost like there was a virus that was passed along, or some sort of infection that was passed along, that gets passed along to everybody, and nobody gets away from it. Okay? Uh, <clears throat> we almost have... The Bible, doesn't, the Bible doesn't say it this way, so I want to be careful about this. Um, and whenever I say this to somebody, I, I try to um, precede it just like I did with you right there, okay? So, uh, the Bible doesn't say this, but <clears throat> there's, there, are some, there are some satanic desires in us, aren't there? You think about the I wills of Satan, and then think about yourself. And there's, there's just this desire. We, we have desires that are not far from the way Satan works. Uh, what, what is one thing that uh, Satan is called? He's <clears throat> called the father of lies. Right? In fact, uh, Jesus even called, uh, called, he told the Pharisees uh, and the religious leaders that Satan was their father. Well, that's an interesting thought, isn't it? Okay, so it, it's almost like, in a sense, we, we've got some kind of, uh, once again, the Bible doesn't say this, but some kind of satanic seed in us, that we're just, in our fallen state, we're just a lot like him. That's kind of a, that's kind of a scary thing, isn't it? Okay. <clears throat> All right, now, <clears throat> the great thing is, so let's just throw in a little bit of good news right here, and we'll get to more of the good news eventually. But 2 Corinthians chapter 5, 17. This will be a, a very familiar <clears throat> verse for anybody who's been around Christianity for any length of time. <clears throat> Alright, 2 Corinthians 5, 17. It says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ... He is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. We're going to take a look at other verses that, that show this. But there, when, when we become a, a new creation, things change for us in, in amazing ways. Okay, so we, we have to spend time going through this with people. I believe people that are struggling with sin. But there's a second chart that we'll get to that's really actually a lot more exciting than this one because it shows Jesus at this idol's level. And I, I love to say to people, uh, when Jesus is your idol, everything is going to be okay. And now I'll always back it up and say this. When you love God above anything else and you have a relationship with him, everything is going to be okay. Okay, so 2 Corinthians 5, 17, we'll talk more about that later. But of course, right now, we know that the struggle with the law of sin still exists according to Romans chapter 6 and 7. Let's take a quick look at that before we continue tonight. All right, Romans chapter 6, verse 19. All right, Romans 6, 19, and then we'll take a look at, uh, starting at chapter 7, verse 15. All right, Romans 6, 19, and Paul says here, I speak in human terms because of the weakness of your flesh. For just as you presented your members as slaves of uncleanness and of lawlessness leading to more lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves of righteousness for holiness. But think of that phrase, the weakness of your flesh. You can feel it, can't you? Man. Let's go to uh, Romans uh, 7, starting at verse 15 then. Romans 7, 15. We can all identify with this. For what I am doing, I do not understand. For what I will to do, that I do not practice. But what I hate, that I do. If then I do what I will not to do, I agree with the law that it is good. But now it is no longer I who, who do it, but sin that dwells in me. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, Nothing good dwells. For to will is present with me, but how to perform what is good I find not. For the good that I will to do, I do not do. But the evil I will not to do, that I practice. Now, if I do what I will not to do, 
It is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. I find then a law. It's interesting that this is that this word is used. A law. That evil is present with me, the one who wills to do good. For I delight in the law of God according to the inward man. But I see another law warring in my, in my members, warring against the law of my mind, and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin which is in my members. O wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from the body of this death? And then deliverance in Jesus Christ, verse 25. I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then with the mind, I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. All right. Okay, now, let's, uh, let's continue on our chart here. So we've worked our way, we've talked about the heart. Uh, we've talked about heart corruption, how that happened, extremely important. We've talked about the desires of the flesh, desires of the eyes, desires for glory and superiority. Now we're at the idols level. So, um, idols always grow out of the desires. And this is one of the things that I think could be changed in the biblical counseling uh, community right now is that the way many writers write or talk about idolatry, they'll take idols and put it at the lowest possible level, and then this level doesn't even really exist. This doesn't get talked about very much in biblical counseling, and I really think it needs to, okay? So you can see that idolatry is not the lowest level of sin, but idols always proceed from desires, all right? So let's take a look at these uh, idols then. These are the results of <coughs> Result of curve in uh, desires. These are things that we put before God and thinking they will satisfy us. Of course, but anything that's cut off from God can never satisfy. So you can see there's a blue box on your charts right here. And that was the sentence that I just read. Okay? So you can always use that to explain to people what this, what this layer is all about. Okay, so here are the desires then, or the idols for desires of the flesh. Okay, so fallen desires of the flesh will lead us to the unhindered chasing of pleasure, sex, alcohol, sports, exercise, food, comfort, hobbies, health, video games, music, movies, and entertainment. There might be some other things that are not on this list. And I think most of these are, are pretty simple to understand. What about... What about health? The reason why I put that one on here, and I think I might have said this in an earlier lesson, health is on here because it doesn't feel good to feel bad. And so some people have a sense of, you know, they, maybe they've been sick several times and they've been through some things that were pretty grueling and, and really hard. And so then what happens? Well, they can become health fanatics. Okay, and then they can begin to, in a sense, idolize their health, and they put their health at the top, as if health was the number one thing on the planet. It feels good to feel good, doesn't it? And we should take care of our bodies, and we should eat right, and we should exercise, and all those kinds of things. But that's not, that's not the be-all, end-all of life, is it? Our health? But for some people, and, and you've met them, right? Health things just reign too high, and it and it kind of, uh, for some people, health dominates their life. You know, uh, whether it's health food, uh, you know, never eating anything that has eyes or something like that, okay? Uh, health food, uh, you know, maybe it could be, you know, doing yoga or some other kind of exercise or something like that, getting enough rest. It just dominates their life from the time they wake up until the time they go to bed at night. But we shouldn't approach it like that. We should take care of our health, but we have to put it in, in its place. All right, the rest of these things that are on the list here are pretty, for things that are pretty easy to follow. Uh, I'll mention one more off the list there. How about, how about comfort? The middle-aged American male. Man, I tell you what. Uh, we love our comforts, right? We want our houses at the right temperature. Um, you know, the remote's got to be within reach. Uh, everything's got to be just exactly right for us. And if it's not, we can sometimes react to that wrongly. All right? So for some people, a comfort can be a real idol. We'll talk about more of these in our discussion time uh, when we finish tonight. 
All right, let's talk just briefly then about addiction and brain chemistry. Here's, an, here's a statement from a Psychology Today article. Uh, it's about dopamine. Dopamine is a neurotransmitter that helps control the brain's reward and pleasure centers. Dopamine also helps regulate movement and emotional responses, and it enables us not only to see rewards, but to take action and move toward them. Here's a second uh, article. This is out of, uh, from the American Psychological Association. It comes from a, an article entitled Dopamine and Desire, so linking dopamine and desire. It says just simply this statement, dopamine promotes what we think of as one thing. We used to think of dopamine, if you remember years past, we used to think of dopamine as the uh, neurotransmitter that was released in our, in our brains when we did something that was pleasurable. Further brain study has shown <coughs> that dopamine actually promotes desire. Okay, now there will be some people that it will be very helpful for you to just bring it up and talk about it for a minute or two. And here's the reason why. It's helpful for people to understand that pleasurable things are a whole body experiences. Okay, so when you do something pleasurable, there's something else happening in your body. There's a release of chemicals, all right? So let's take an addict who is consistently going after a certain kind of pleasure, and there would be many of them, right? But going after a certain type of pleasure, there's going to be a release of chemicals, not just dopamine, but others, and I'm, I'm no brain scientist or brain specialist, but there's gonna be a release of certain chemicals that are just gonna keep kind of hammering that home. And um, it's a whole body experience, and we're responsible for the stewardship of our whole bodies. And we cannot let desire, and we cannot let pleasure be the thing that drives us, all right? So think of it in that term of whole body events and stewardship of the body, and we're not called to live for pleasure. So we have to be, I think we have to be so careful as, as people, we have to be so careful with desires of the flesh. I'm grateful that God gave them to us, we can use the five senses of our body to experience some really pleasurable things, but they have to be measured, don't they? We really know that. Uh, so we've got to exercise stewardship, uh, stewardship of desires, maybe we could say. And, and we're just whole body, we're whole body people. All right, let's take a look at idols for desires of the eyes. So we did idols for desires of the flesh. Here's idols for desires of the eyes. And of course, this is, this is the depraved desires of the eyes. This, this would not be the um, renewed sense or the recreated desires of the eyes. But here they are. Possessions, money, cars, clothes. Of course, uh, cars would be a, more of a guy thing. And clothes would be more of a girl thing. Although there's obviously overlap right there, right? Um, a person. I'll come back to that one in a minute. All right, relationships, houses and property, and technology. All right, so think about a person. Think about the desire to have ownership of, of a person. Uh, we've talked about this one briefly before, but when a man sees a beautiful woman and wants to take ownership of a person, but that can also happen in the reverse as well, right? Uh, think about the term teen idol. Teen idols are generally guys that teen girls are attracted to. How many girls would love to would love to have a date with the latest teen idol or the latest teen heartthrob? How many of how many teenage girls would love to take that guy? I realize uh, you know Justin Bieber is you know, becoming a little bit passe now, but how many girls would love to walk hand in hand with Justin Bieber through the halls of their high school and say, you know, hand in hand, he's mine. You know, walking down the hall, he's mine. You know, he's mine. There would be something about that, wouldn't there? So this idea of idol, something you can grasp and, and draw uh, to yourself. 
All right, so these are, so this is all about objects of affection then. As you, as you think about this desires of the eyes, think about objects of, of affection. All right, here's, a, here's an illustration that I will almost always use when going through the, the idols for desires of the eyes here. You've heard of story, stories of a man who has a beautiful girlfriend and she wants to leave him. And he will do something to hurt her in some way. I think of two stories. There was a model back in the uh, 80s or maybe it was the early 90s. And she had a boyfriend and she was, she left him. And so he found her and he cut with a knife giant slashes across her face. So a few of them, I don't remember how many, but it took stitches to put her back together and she never looked the same. You can still find that story on the internet. Um, and then recently, uh, let's see, 2013, a girl by the name of Christy Sims and her boyfriend splashed sulfuric acid on her face. And basically his whole thing was, if I can't own her beauty and if I can't own her, then nobody else will. Because she is mine. So when you think of the word mine, you know, when you hear the word mine, in the church nursery over there, that's coming straight out of the desires of the eyes. I see it, I want it, that's mine. Uh, one other illustration that you could give, then this is more of a statement than an illustration. When a marriage is built on physical attraction alone, it is destined to fail, because corrupt desire and true love are radical opposites, and yet most people equate those, don't they? So corrupt, Desire is built on self-love, while true love is built on others' love. Think about the think about the unbelievable reversal there is in love. Think about how we are first initially attracted to the person that you know a, a, a boyfriend, a girlfriend, uh, attracted to our spouse. What was the attraction first? It was it was related to outward appearance generally, right? And that's. When we think of love, that's just so backwards, all right? So corrupt desire is built on self-love, while true love is built on others' love. And so most relationships begin with corrupted desire. <laughs> is it any surprise that so many relationships go bad when it's, when that, when it's established, first of all, in a corrupt, uh, selfish form of love? All right, let's go to our last category here. This would be desires, then, for... Uh, Desires for glory, the idols for those. All right, so we've got here superiority, control, authority, order, image, career. And you can see there's some overlap in these. Success, fame, uh, morality. Some people, they build their life on making sure that their life is more moral than somebody else's life. And that's what they live for. If they're living better than somebody else is, they feel good about themselves and that's what they live for. From time to time, in working with teenagers, I would see this happen. Um, where a teenager would come into the youth group or would grow up into the youth group and it was a teen maybe that, that kind of stayed a little bit farther back from sin. Uh, but I would sometimes watch uh, some teens having a little bit of a sense of superiority over other teens because this team wasn't doing things that other teens were doing. And so they felt good about themselves based on their morality. All right next there you see respect or approval, power and position, correctness, you know, just being right, honor, prestige, education or security. Let's take uh, Education. How many times do you think a college freshman sits in a big college classroom? Think about those kind of like those auditorium seating classrooms where there's the professor is down in the front and there's 200 students in the classroom. How many times do you think a college freshman looks down at that teacher down there and thinks to themselves, wow, I want to be standing right there someday? I want to be standing right there in front of all of these people. You know, could, could it be for some professors even, it's a little bit of like a godlike experience 
be in charge of that classroom and just you know all eyes all eyes on me I'm the one that's doing the teaching I'm the sum of all answers and I wonder I wonder how often some people go into education and get PhDs for no other reason than for pure pride because they want to be the one that's at the top. They want to be the one that's looked at and idolized and admired. Okay, so sometimes education. How about security? How does security fit here? Uh, everybody wants security, but the Bible says that safety is of the Lord. And I think some people in pride believe they do not need God, and then they must create their own security with riches and other forms of protection. All right? We'll talk, we'll see more about how desires for glory plays out when we get to the indicators higher on the chart. But that at least gives you a little bit of a feel for how these uh, categories play out. Now let's do one more thing before we're done tonight. Take a look at Colossians 3, <coughs> verse 5. Colossians 3, 5. We'll do this kind of quickly because this doesn't really matter that much for counseling, but I think it will kind of round out your, your understanding, just a little bit of these categories. Now, um, well, here, I'll read the verse, and then I'll ask a question. I'll, it's going to be a little bit of a riddle for you, then. All right, Colossians 3, 5. It says, Therefore, put to death your members which are on the earth, fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. Now, when you read this verse through the first time, you might think to yourself, all of those things are idolatry. When you take a look at the syntax of the verse, you'll notice there's a bit of a break. So it lists these, first of all, it lists sexual sins, and then it lists covetousness, and it only lists covetousness as idolatry. Okay? Ephesians 5.5 5 has the same basic idea. It talks about a covetous man who is an idolater. Okay, so I'm not I'm not asking you to uh, to figure this to figure this out because this is not that easy to figure out. Uh, why is only covetousness listed as idolatry in that verse when the rest of the other things aren't? Think about that. And here's the answer to the question. So as you take a look at these three categories of desire, let me start with this category first. Desires of the flesh. This is a sensory experience that's temporal. There's nothing, there's nothing we could say, there's nothing to touch and clutch. There's nothing to hold on to. It's just momentary and then it's gone. And it's a, it's a memory. Okay, desires for glory and superiority, it's, it's the same way. You, there's nothing for you to hold on to. There's nothing, there's nothing uh, physical, okay? It's about image. It's about, it's about intangibles. Now, take a look at this category in the middle, desires of the eyes. This one is about ownership. This one is about stuff you can touch. All of it is about stuff you can touch. Stuff that you see, that you want, that you want to, you know, make it part of your collection, okay, things that you own. So, covetousness and desires of the eyes are identical. So, covetousness is idolatry, and idolatry is all about having physical things that you place before God. Now, we're, I, I realize we're, we're kind of, you know, we've kind of expanded it to put all of these things and make idols of all of these things, but if we were to be very specific, idolatry uh, is talking about physical things that you can touch. Now, um, the... Uh, when, when we get when we read the Ten Commandments, you know, you're not supposed to have anything else before God. It's very clear right at the beginning. Don't have anything else before God. So it's not wrong for us to say that there are going to be idols in these other categories. But when you read Colossians 3 5 and Ephesians 5 5, and you know, you wonder about that verse, think about it in this way. Covetousness is idolatry because it's about physical items that you can actually have and hold. So hopefully that rounds out your idea uh, then related to um, idolatry. Let's do one more thing and then we'll be done. Uh, just think about, think about the, 
the forbidden tree with Eve. Uh, was Eve an idolater when she came to the tree? And the answer to the question is yes, she was. It was actually the first act of idolatry, okay? Even though there wasn't a man-made, man-carved idol, okay? She felt these three desires, but she wanted to take ownership, and she wanted to take that fruit and have it be hers. She wanted it to be hers. And, but, but the thing to remember as we continue to go through this is that desire always preceded the idol. All right, we'll pick it up uh, next week.